I will pray us into this time together. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord God, you who are a rock and our redeemer. Spirit, we have felt you here in this space. Give us ears to hear your word of resurrection this morning. Amen. So I want to see from a show of hands how many of you have used uh, this thing called Zoom video conferencing in the past two years? Okay, so most of you have, I see. And uh, I want to see another show of hands of those who have perhaps struggled with it sometimes, maybe muting, video, some struggle, just a show of hands if there's been any struggle with this. I want to show you the top four struggles on video when it comes to Zoom. These are things that I too have done. So I'm not poking fun of any of you out there. These are things that happen to most of us. We have the person who is unaware of where the camera is. They seem to lean in a little bit too much and their face is kind of captured, half captured. Uh, that might be you or me. We have the person um, also who happens to be in the witness protection program. <laughs> yeah, we all want to say, just turn on the lights. We want to see your face. Um, we have the person who seems to think they can carry their camera along with them as they're moving, like throughout the house. <laughs> And so you see this video just kind of shaking back and forth. And then, of course, we have the person who uh, simply doesn't turn on the camera at all. Can you see me? Can you see me now? Now, we know that uh, Zoom, it's one of those things that we had to do to stay connected during a time of COVID. But the best is when we can meet in person, to see each other face to face. We get to experience the body language and the joy and just the presence and essence of a human being when we are with them in person. It's very different on Zoom, isn't it? This morning, we are saying that Jesus Christ is in fact living and breathing in front of us. You might say, well, I haven't, I haven't seen the Lord. I haven't seen him walking down the street. I haven't had coffee with him. I don't know what you're talking about, Pastor Angela. But I'm here to declare Easter morning that Jesus Christ is, in fact, alive. And Jesus is alive all around us. What a beautiful morning to celebrate Easter. Everything is in bloom. We experience Easter when we wake up in the morning and take a deep breath in our lungs and we say, oh, we are alive. We experience Easter when we engage other human beings in laughter and we see children playing and we, it, we share our stories one to each other. That is the living Christ. We see Christ in each one of us. In fact, Jesus said... When you do it unto the least of them, you do it unto me. It is as if Christ is right in front of you. Let's enter into our Chris, uh, Christmas, wrong holiday, Easter celebration story. John 20. Mary, Mary Magdalene. Gosh, there's a lot to say about Mary Magdalene. A lot of folks have said that Mary Magdalene had many spirits in her and Jesus had set her free. Uh, we now know that that could have been some mental illness or some struggles or some addiction. Gosh, a lot going on with Mary Magdalene. Other folks say that Mary Magdalene was a sex worker and met Jesus and for whatever reason was able to follow Christ and let go of that life. Whatever it was, 
Mary Magdalene's life was forever changed. And when her friend, her teacher, her person was killed, she, I can't even imagine the, the kind of pain that she experienced. She was the first one that ran to the tomb Sunday morning to care for the body as Jewish Hebrew people did at that time. She wanted to be with Christ, and then she gets there, and the stone is rolled away in front of the, this cave tomb that they had in the ancient world. And the first thought that goes through her head is, oh my goodness, they've stolen his body. Uh, grave robbers were very common, not only in the ancient world, but we see grave robbers, gosh, up to, I don't know, 100 years ago. And so she panicked. She ran to the people she knew. She said, hey, uh, Jesus' body is gone. Of course, she was a woman in the ancient world. They did not believe her, so they had to go see for themselves. So Peter and John runs out. They run out. They see, in fact, that Jesus is missing. And there in the scripture it says, somehow, in seeing this empty tomb, John believed, had faith, that something happened that was incredible and miraculous. They left, and Mary is left weeping in that space. And this is what the scriptures say. In verse 11, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been, lying one at the head and the other at the feet. And if you recall in the story, thank you, Roger, for stepping in, she, the angels are exactly where the linens were left. Another indication that something heavenly, something sacred, something of God had occurred here. Verse 13, and they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? What an odd question. Of course we know why she's weeping. Her loved one has passed, has died, has been killed. She said to, him, to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. These grave robbers have stolen his body. Verse 14, when she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Her eyes had not opened yet. It makes me wonder about how many times we do not see Jesus, God's presence in our life. Verse 15, Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Again, indicating that she was searching, longing, wanting. Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, like if you have something to do with this, uh, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Like I will take him back. It's okay, I'll give you a second chance. If you're the grave robber, just tell me where the body is. All will be forgiven. Just tell me so I can go and find him. And Jesus said to her, and this is my favorite part in the story. He calls her by name, Mary. She turned and, and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Her eyes were opened. She encountered the risen Christ. Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me. Because I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary, I am not just here for you. I am here for the world. I am here for everyone. I need to go be with God so that it will be fulfilled, so that I can extend this grace for the whole world. And verse 18, Mary Magdalene 
went and announced, proclaimed to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. In fact, many scholars believe that Mary Magdalene here was the first preacher to announce that Jesus, in fact, had been risen. And the story, if you follow Mary Magdalene's story, she did not just hold on to the truth there. She went everywhere in the known middle, uh, in the Middle East and in India to proclaim that Jesus, in fact, was risen. She was committed to this message of love. Sometimes in life, things happen to us, and we don't know in the moment how sacred they are, how holy they are. That in fact, in that moment that God has met us, and these are one of those moments that happened to me just a couple weeks ago. I am a part of an online gaming community uh, led by United Methodists, and in this platform, it's kind of like Zoom, it's called Discord, uh, we have uh, weekly um, devotionals and we talk about faith and God while people game, I know, it's amazing. And there in that space, I realized that somebody there was logged in, and I was inviting them to come to our chat portion to come speak with us. And so I reached out to them and said, hey, why don't you join us? And this person said, I cannot. And I said, why not? I was curious. And I'm going to share with you the message they sent me. This person said, I'm in Kiev right now. I was startled right when I heard that. And I thought to myself, is he trolling me? <laughs> is, this, is he really in Kiev? And he spelled it in the non-Russian way, which I had known. He spelled it in the Ukrainian way. And so I thought, oh my goodness. This person right, might really be in Ukraine right now. So I said to him, wow, serious, what are you doing there? I wanted to see exactly, engage him in conversation. And he says to me, they won't let me leave. He goes on to say, I live here. I say, did you think about leaving earlier? He says, my mom left with my sister to Poland and I'm stuck here with my dad. I respond, wow, I'm sorry. Sounds really scary. He said, you get used to the shells. I think my heart stopped when I read that part. And I was thinking about who he was and what life is like there in that space. And so I asked him, how old are you? And he said, 19. He responds, 18 to 60 year old men are not allowed to leave, which is what we've heard. I respond, wow, my church has been praying for you and helping the best we can. And he says, yeah, we really need it. My friend voluntarily joined to army and I have no clue where he is. I respond, wow, I'm really sorry. And he says, it's not your fault. And I say, yes, but my heart goes out to you. He says, thanks. And then he says, I must go, not allowed on internet for too long or they track. And I say, wow, okay, let me know how you're doing. That was the last time I had contact with him. And I thought to myself, after the fact, I go, God, I've been praying for the people of Ukraine for so many weeks at this point, and here you allow me to engage and extend a little grace, a little hope to this young person across the sea, a person that I don't even know who he is or what his life is like, but here we have this moment to extend grace one to each other. Things happen sometimes in our lives, and we are called 
to reach out and extend conversation and hope to the people who, we, who are around us. I want to close our time with this. You know, there are so many people in this world, people of faith and people of science, who I see Jesus in. And sometimes you think, well, they have to profess it just so, or they have to believe so, just so, and that's not the case. You see, there is hope and love and light in people's lives, and when you see it, your heart identifies with that light and hope. I'm going to show you a video of these folks that I have admired so much. I have a dream. Ask not what your country can do for you. The time to build is upon us. All the nations shall find blessing. The common language of science. Is your heart right? Peace on earth, that implies no violence. There is an indefinable, mysterious power that pervades everything. Mm. Poverty is our freedom and our strength. We are taking care of nearly 46,000 lepers. There is always there's one more bed, one more plate of rice, one more blanket to cover. And we are trying to bring that love and peace and joy to our neighbor and to to the, in the street we live, in the town we live, and then again to the whole world. And I think love begins at home. Take one person, individual person, one person at a time. We can serve only one at a time. We can love only one at a time. Yet the whole world, though we are, it sounds so big and so much and all that, yet it is but only a drop in the ocean. But if we didn't do that little drop, that ocean would be one drop less. Help somebody in their own family first and then next door neighbor. Vocation is uh, belonging to Christ. The work is only a means to put our love for Christ into action. The work is not my work. It is the work of us all and you and me because it is his work. Teresa said, I see Jesus in every human being. I say to myself, this is hungry Jesus. I must feed him, this is sick Jesus. This one has leprosy or gangrene. I must wash him and tend to him. I serve because I love Jesus. Each and every one of us, we have the sacred light in our lives. We as people of faith are called to see that light. We are called to serve and to share that compassion and grace in every and any capacity that we have. And you don't have to go across the world to extend that grace. It could just happen on your social media. It could just happen on Zoom. It could happen through text. It's reaching out and saying, I care about you. You're not alone. You can get through this. Let me pray for you. Extending that grace is what it means for us to be Easter people, resurrection people. For this young man that I encountered through social media, just for a moment, may God bless him. May God deliver the people of Ukraine. And may we extend that grace. Christ is living and is in our midst. Resurrection is all around us. Do you see it? Do you see the Lord?
Lord, thank you that your light shines so bright. You have given us the whole natural world that sings your praises. The birds are declaring your glory. Help us be aware of your presence here in this world. Help us see that you are in fact living. You are living in us. You are living in others. And give us the grace and the courage to extend that kindness, just simple kindness, one to each other so that we can in fact be the Easter people that you see in us already. We pray all this in the living Christ. Amen.